Sir Kannan Gopalakrishnan. He was working as a senior architect at Engineering Design Research Center L&T Construction, India's largest construction company. He's also worked on projects ranging from institutional buildings to international airports, apartment complexes to aircraft hangars. He's also attended 3 international conferences and 2 national conferences and has also presented technical papers at the Jawaharlal Nehru University Delhi and the MSRIT Bangalore he's also won the national championship at Archimen at the India's largest architecture quiz sir kannan gopalakrishnan currently runs a design firm habitat design studio and he is also a visiting faculty at the renowned architecture schools in tamil nadu Welcome back to UGC lecture series this is AR6502 history of architecture and culture 5 we are in unit 1 leading to a new architecture this is lecture number 6 and if you remember the previous lecture we saw romantic neoclassicism we saw how romantic neoclassicism existed uh, started from literature in ukraine and we also saw the famous works of uh, the great architect ledov where he studied what he did and uh, we saw where his inspirations come from and he saw we saw a very beautiful example of royal sort works at arkesana and in this building we saw how uh, ladaw beautifully used pragmatic examples and also designed a very beautiful neoclassicist building in its entirety in its functional aspects so in this episode we'll be looking at two or three more architects and some of their works equally interesting as that of ladaw and equally important works in neoclassicist architecture Ira and in this episode we'll be looking at more of romantic neoclassicism we'll be looking at the works of uh, Boulle, Duran, Jefferson these are famous architects who did works in France and United States of America and let's take a look at Boulle Etienne Louis Boulle he was one of the architects who evokes sublime emotions of terror and tranquility at the same time through the grandeur of his works His works are so magnificent, so grand, that at the same point of time, you will feel both terror and tranquility in his buildings. He believed that geometrical purity is very important. He thought of monumental forms at all the time, and he thought that when geometric purity is there, the ornament should not be there. So he was basically looking at an unadorned geometric purity of monumental form. and he also believed that light is one of the very important aspects of architecture and uh, if you have light you have divine according to boulle so he went on with all removing of all unnecessary ornamentation which usually clutters all the buildings in neoclassical style and the earlier baroque style more so baroque and rococo more so so what he did was he started removing all the unnecessary ornamentation which was required and he had the raw forms what he did with the raw geometric form was he inflated them to huge scale huge proportions grand monument and monumental scale and he had repetitive elements so he had uh, regularity he had symmetry he had a variety he had rhythm within the repeating elements at one point of time he had an ordering principle between the elements so each and every element in his design had an ordering principle that worked in tandem with each other that was louis etienne boulle for you take a look at some of his most famous works you can see the screen right now you have huge building where he designed as a senator for isaac newton look at his form he had taken the bare essential sphere he has blown it to huge proportion uh, the proportions you can appreciate if i add the sentence that this right here is a cypress tree so if this is a cypress tree imagine the size of the building which he has conceptualized such was his grand ideas and uh, here again you can see some of the works of boulle wherein he tries to use cylinder vault columns rectangles squares semicircles and basic all basic forms that you would use in in basic architecture but blown to extraordinary proportions and he believed that architecture should be made expressive of its purpose um he people talked about architecture parlante when he was designing 
uh, let me take a moment to explain what architecture parlante means. Um, at that particular point of time, in schools of France, people were taught that architecture needs to talk for itself. The architect need not talk about the building, whereas the architecture itself needs to talk on itself. So, what else can an architect do than blow up the geometrical form for itself into enormous proportion? Thereby, the building itself talks and talks loud. So, architectural parlante was very, very common uh, in his architecture. His uh, senator for Sir Isaac Newton, the English scientist, was actually not built, it was just in design forms. It would have taken the form of a sphere that is 150 meters high. Imagine 150 meters, which is bigger than the length of a football field. That high was this idea of a senator for the famous English scientist Isaac Newton. The structure was never built as such, but the design was engraved and circulated widely in a lot of professional circles. It was engraved, it was sent in sketch form, it was circulated widely. A lot of people got to know about the project and started appreciating Bully for his great effort. Uh, there was a small sarcophagus placed for Newton in the lower pole of the spear, right in the center in the bottom. There was a sarcophagus for Newton which was kept and uh, the memorial creates a beautiful effect of day and night inside the building. So, I will explain that to you in a moment. Uh, before that, we have to take a look at uh, the celestial phenomena that was created in this building. So, this is how the building looked in plan. This is the first cylinder and this is the second cylinder. This is the sphere that was kept on top and here in the section you can see the sarcophagus placed in the middle and there is a small viewing platform for in the center for the visitor. The huge movement of time and celestial phenomena was inscribed in this famous in this building so beautifully. The viewer is also in isolation. There is a small viewing platform here wherein he has to stand and view it. If you look at the building here, you can see the first cylinder over here. This is the second cylinder. This is the big first cylinder. This is the second cylinder and the sphere which was inscribed inside the building. So, the first cylinder, second cylinder and the building which was inscribed. These are rows of cypress trees that I was talking about. So, if the rows of cypress trees are of this size, you can clearly visualize how big the building would have been. Overall height of the building from this point to this point, according to him, would be 150 meters. At the top of the spear's edges, uh, there are small apertures in the stone because it was a stone building and on the top of the stone structure there were small holes which were added in the building. So what happened was it creates small amounts of light to pass through those tiny holes and it will come into the building. So inside the building during the day all the lights inside the building were turned off. So it will look like night effect in the, in the day because of small lights everywhere creating flooding uh, uh, small bits of lights creating starlight. So, the sphere will look like the night sky because of its darkness and because of its form and small lights that come in pores at different days, different places will create the starlight effect. So, he has tried to create the night sky when there is day outside and what happens during the night? During the night, he has put up a central large light fixture which floods light through the sphere as sunlight. During the night, there is this huge light fixture which spreads light throughout the sphere and during the day when there is sunlight outside, there is this tiny holes which make up the night sky. He even made larger holes for moons and brighter stars the smaller holes for the less bright ones and during the night when there is darkness outside, there is brightness inside. So, in this building, the architect has created the night in the day 
on the day and the night. How clever. So now it's time for us to move on from the great architect Boulay to another famous architect during that point of time, Durand. Jean Nicolas Louis Durand was an architect who built very little. He didn't build a lot of structures, yes, but he influenced a whole generation of architects. Uh, they were Schinkel, Gartner, Clancy, Sempur, and a lot of other people who studied with Durand. So he had a lot of ideas and uh, what he actually did was he reduced all his extravagant great ideas into normative economic typology buildings so that he thought all great ideas also needs to come in simpler form so that uh, simplicity will give wider use of the building not just one or two buildings here and there where people can express architecture and appreciate it it shouldn't be the case where so he thought every single man should be able to appreciate the gifts of architecture that has been given to the world so what he did was he reduced all the extravagant ideas into small normative and economic typology houses so he did was uh, he established a universal building concept through which he was one of the first persons who think of modular permutation on a fixed plan so he has one plan and he has different according to the styles according to re requirement he can change the elevation he can change work on different elevations different uh, uh, requirements based on the amount of money that was possible by the client his elevations also changed so he was able to give what the client wanted and not just one or two projects uh, famous neoclassical architecture with grandeur with things like Boulay did what he did was he thought the idea of architecture should reach even the simplest of the common man so let's take a look at the different prototype plans that he made so he made a lot of plans he made a lot of elevation he made a lot of schemes in his architecture so using the same plan he was able to create different types of elevations and different types of buildings uh, the one type is this and one other type is this and he was able to create different types of elevation different types of works for the same plan so what he did was he in the 1800s uh, Durand wrote a treatise it was called the Mechanisme de la Composition he proposed axonometric drawing for the first time as ideal perspective projection for designing buildings and what he also did was he marked he worked on different modular level plants and different modular level elevations for each of the plan which he designs so which means as a common man he can I can pick a plan and an elevation according to my budget so I will also get the benefit of architecture I will also get the benefit of being uh, designed by an architect at my price such is the grand idea of Durand simple but magnificent he was in the idea that buildings could be planned in repetitive modular units he believed that repetition and modular units was one of the uh, fundamentals of architecture uh, that their basic framework could be clad in different styles of architecture according to function or taste so the basic framework which is the plan can work with different architectural styles the same plan could all always represent different architectural styles according to Durand uh, if the client wanted uh, let's say uh, Rococo architecture if he's able to spend a lot of money then he could do the same plan in Lococo architecture and if the client wants neoclassical then voila you can have a romantic neoclassical building or even a structural neoclassical building for that example so according to the requirement and according to the money that a person can afford to spend according to function according to taste the style of architecture can be changed in different styles according to him so uh, he also believed that rich decoration was not essential to an get an architectural effect for an architectural effect he believed that there was a perfect way in which if you plan it properly if you design it if you design it properly you will get the architectural effect so what happened was if you don't pay enough to an architect if you don't uh, get it uh, people thought that the idea that architectural effect won't come only it will come only when you start doing rich decoration only when you uh, start spending a lot of money so this misconception was broken by Durand at that early point of time as 1800s so this was the 
a perfect formula which he developed for large urban settlements and cities and which can be built very quickly and in very economic manner. Let's take a look at how uh, Durand sketches. He takes a piece of paper, he draws fine grid lines of equal sizes, then he draws plans and then according to the plans he makes elevations of the buildings according to them he makes different sections. So he makes different combinations with the same kind of plan he was able to make different kinds of elevation different types of elevation one with a flat roof with uh, double height buildings with a mezzanine height with grand arches another one with a uh, sloping roof like a pediment with columns uh, with, with, with uh, Greek style styling on on the top with the second floor another one is a simple one story building with normal with a fl very flat roof with large steps leading to the front of the building on all four sides like like Villa Capra. So with this basic uh, grid sheet he was able to pro provide and propose different varieties of plans and elevations and different styling and, and uh, this was something which was famous about Durand. He believed that architecture was not about visual gestures and making things grand. He was a, he, w he thought that uh, a problem resolved well and uh, done efficiently would be automatically invested with meaning. So he thought that there, there is a problem and the problem has to be efficiently and pro resolved properly and then automatically meaning would come to the building according to his opinion. And his treatise included beautifully drawn pristine plants, sections and elevations all drawn with fine lines uh, over a regulating grid uh, with utmost austerity and precision. With this manner, he questioned the tradition of elaborate watercolor renders that were produced at the School of Fine Arts at that particular point of time. At that point of time, what happens was architects usually don't give plans and elevation. They don't draw plans uh, like what we do today. What they did was they produced a grand watercolor scheme with, uh, with trees and with fountains and all that. So they produced paintings. So these paintings were the only ones which were shown to the clients to explain about them just as how we show 3D render views today to explain to a client those time they showed elaborate watercolor paintings to convey the, to the client so because that is the only way an architect and a client can think about the same building in the same manner because if you draw a plan client cannot visualize the plan but Durand changed the way the plans were given to the client and plans were given for, for an architectural building. He was one of the first people who started drawing plans, elevations and sections with fine lines on regulating grid patterns and, and that is when it all started. Durand started and even after 200 years we are still doing uh, drawing fine lines over regulating grids even today. This is some of the works that Durand made. Here you can see the fact that the entire building can be broken down into simple logical lines, uh, so lines intersecting in the middle and a square that is being formed by four lines and intersecting at equal size on both sides is other things and with this he is able to produce one, two, three bays, one, two, three bays over here and the central opening is a central thing and three bays on all sides. And with this thing, he is able to elaborate this thing into this particular uh, way of doing it. He elaborated this to this and from this evolved this and from this he evolved this and from this evolved this. From here, you could do as many wonders as doing something like this and if you take one particular point of this, you can, you can work wonders and this scheme is what you see something here, the central scheme over here. He put forward a rational and specialized theory of architecture which is free from the speculations of metaphysics at that point of time. Durand was a genius not because he built a lot of buildings but mainly because of his ideas. He wrote a treatise, he wrote books, he trained a lot of people including Schenkel and others and most importantly he brought architecture to the common man. Previously, architecture was only meant for palaces, churches, grand buildings, dukes, earls, major, major economic hotspot areas and 
some point of time for grand factories and other places yes but durand really brought it down to a very very small level even for the local commonest man who is earning a modest amount so that was the achievement that durand made even though he didn't build a lot of buildings it's time for us to move on to another famous architect who is none other than thomas jefferson from the united states of america if you were wondering who thomas jefferson was yes he is the american president thomas jefferson he is not just an architect he was also the american president once american form of neoclassicism or neo palladianism as they like to call it uh, was embodied in the american president and polymath Th- thomas jefferson he designed his own house his own uh, retreat uh, his school his designs for the homes of his friends and political allies Uh, especially barber's will and he made famous the use of octagon and octagonal forms in his design what thomas jefferson designed in america was he made italian designs simpler for american use this is some of the buildings which thomas jefferson designed you can clearly see the ionic columns the pediments the corinthian columns the dome that resembled pantheon he took everything from the classical architecture and his architecture is sometimes also attributed as jeffersonian architecture jeffersonian architecture primarily employs palladian design a palladian design or palladianism is a form of architecture proposed by the famous architect andre palladio who we know him as the designer of villa capra or the villa rotunda which was designed in the 15th century it was designed in that particular era of renaissance architecture the key feature of palladian design is having having a central core symmetrical wings and access from all four sides that was the basics of palladianism for you uh, he had the portico and pediment as one of the primary entrances primary and any primary entrance should have a portico and a pediment on top with columns that was the idea of jeffersonian architecture he thought that the classical orders and moldings especially that of the tuscan order was very very important so he uh, used repeated classical orders in his building a piano nobile the main floor elevated above ground level because piano mobile is where you take a flight of steps and reach the main floor level it is raised above the ground and uh, he uses mostly red brick construction primarily because he uh, loved the way the bricks felt and looked and also it it uh, gives a very good contrast again the white painted columns and uh, uh, the red bricks he used octagons and octagonal forms like i mentioned earlier he used chinese railings and uh, suppressed staircases uh, like that of hidden staircases instead of making grand stairways he had hidden stairways suppressed stairways let's take a look at a few more buildings that he has designed you can see the pediment the grand entry you don't see the entrance here you don't see the staircase it's suppressed or hidden you can see the main entrance portico light elements windows on top unlike the moldings and other things he has windows on top his own house which he designed was based on neoclassical principles which was described in the books of italian renaissance architect andre palladio uh, he reworked his house through much of his presidency time to include design elements which were popular in the late 18th century in Europe it contains many of his own design solutions also let's take a look at way he has designed circular openings octagonal dome on the top main entrance with pediment colonnades french railings here is the plan the east portico with its main columns that you see over here and it has an entrance core the the parlor and which leads to the western portico the main dome is right above this it has symmetrical plans on that side two sides there is a bedroom on one side and the other side the same room is converted to a dining room and his cabinet on this side is converted to the tea room on this side uh, he has piazzas or greenhouses on either sides um and symmetrical rooms on either sides hidden staircases usually people preferred grand staircases right in the middle of the building but 
Jefferson uses hidden staircases, which was not visible from any of the access. And uh, during his presidency time, when he was reworking on the project, he added a central hallway and a parallel set of rooms to the structure, uh, it, which doubled the area of the entire building. He removed the second full height story from the original house and he replaced with a bedroom floor which is in the mezzanine level. The most dramatic element of the new design was the octagonal dome itself. The room inside the dome was uh, once described by one of the visitors as a noble and beautiful apartment, but was rarely used. One reason because it was very hot in summer and very cold in winter, and number two because it could only be reached by climbing a step of a very narrow flight of steep staircase. So this room was very, very badly used. These are some of the buildings that uh, Jefferson designed. Here again, you can see the octagonal core. You can use Chinese railings, grand entrances, um, pediment, use of light inside the pediment instead of using decoration and carving and some moldings. And uh, also you can see the ordering principles which are very, very strict and straightforward. Here again, you can see the octagonal uh, way in which he plans things. Uh, entries from all four sides is the entries from other sides, staircases and entrance into the building from this side and this side. Again, Palladian architecture at its peak. If you see a section through this building, you can see parapets which hide the buildings. And you can also see the low height roofs and the taller roofs, which creates a proportioning system with each other. And uh, making the windows as a special element because to justify the use of windows, he had used again the same neoclassical elements where you make each window look like a small house itself. So that element is again used in his architecture. So we've come to an end of this lecture. We understood the elements of romantic neoclassicism with more fine examples. We also tried to understand the ordering principles of romantic neoclassicism and uh, we studied in depth the works of Louis Itini Boulle, Thomas Jefferson, Durand and the way they designed buildings. We saw the famous monumental works of Boulle, we saw the practical and the economically uh, efficient works of uh, Durand and we saw the American version of neoclassicism which is designed by the American President Jefferson. With this learning you should be able to answer some of these questions. Uh, what is romantic neoclassicism from Durand's point of view? Explain the philosophy of building style of Durand with an example. Explain the Neuron Senator with fine sketches. I look forward to meeting you again on the other side of this lecture. So, thank you.